Greetings esteemed viewers, and welcome to Tailingo, the channel dedicated to enhancing your English language proficiency through the art of storytelling. You'll learn English through story. Tailingo was created with the aim of making English learning both highly effective and enjoyable. If you're looking to reach the peak of English proficiency through entertaining stories and novels, don't forget to subscribe Tailingo and press bell icon. The Robber Bridegroom There was once a miller who had one beautiful daughter, and as she was grown up, he was anxious that she should be well married and provided for. He said to himself, I will give her to the first suitable man who comes and asks for her hand. Not long after a suitor appeared, and as he appeared to be very rich and the miller could see nothing in him with which to find fault, he betrothed his daughter to him. But the girl did not care for the man as a girl ought to care for her betrothed husband. She did not feel that she could trust him, and she could not look at him nor think of him without an inward shudder. One day he said to her, You have not yet paid me a visit, although we have been betrothed for some time. I do not know where your house is, she answered. My house is out there in the dark forest, he said. She tried to excuse herself by saying that she would not be able to find the way thither. Her betrothed only replied, You must come and see me next Sunday. I have already invited guests for that day, and that you may not mistake the way, I will strew ashes along the path. When Sunday came, and it was time for the girl to start, a feeling of dread came over her which she could not explain, and that she might be able to find her path again, she filled her pockets with peas and lentils to sprinkle on the ground as she went along. On reaching the entrance to the forest she found the path strewed with ashes, and these she followed, throwing down some peas on either side of her at every step she took. She walked the whole day until she came to the deepest, darkest part of the forest. There she saw a lonely house, looking so grim and mysterious, that it did not please her at all. She stepped inside, but not a soul was to be seen, and a great silence reigned throughout. Suddenly a voice cried, Turn back, turn back, young maiden fair, linger not in this murderer's lair. The girl looked up and saw that the voice came from a bird hanging in a cage on the wall. Again it cried, Turn back, turn back, young maiden fair, linger not in this murderer's lair. The girl passed on, going from room to room of the house, but they were all empty, and still she saw no one. At last she came to the cellar, and there sat a very, very old woman. Who could not keep her head from shaking. Can you tell me, asked the girl, if my betrothed husband lives here? Ah, you poor child, answered the old woman, what a place for you to come to. This is a murderer's den. You think yourself a promised bride, and that your marriage will soon take place, but it is with death that you will keep your marriage feast. Look, do you see that large cauldron of water which I am obliged to keep on the fire? As soon as they have you in their power they will kill you without mercy, and cook and eat you, for they are eaters of men. If I did not take pity on you and save you, you would be lost. Thereupon the old woman led her behind a large cask, which quite hid her from view. Keep as still as a mouse, she said, do not move or speak, or it will be all over with you. Tonight, when the robbers are all asleep, we will flee together. I have long been waiting for an opportunity to escape. The words were hardly out of her mouth when the godless crew returned, dragging another young girl along with them. They were all drunk and paid no heed to her cries and lamentations. They gave her wine to drink, three glasses full, one of white wine, one of red, and one of yellow, and with that her heart gave way and she died. Then they tore off her dainty clothing, laid her on a table, and cut her beautiful body into pieces, and sprinkled salt upon it. The poor betrothed girl crouched trembling and shuddering behind the cask, for she saw what a terrible fate had been intended for her by the robbers. One of them now noticed a gold ring still remaining on the little finger of the murdered girl, and as he could not draw it off easily, he took a hatchet and cut off the finger. But the finger sprang into the air, and fell behind the cask into the lap of the girl who was hiding there. The robber took a light and began looking for it, but he could not find it. Have you looked behind the large cask? said one of the others. But the old woman called out, Come and eat your suppers, 
and let the thing be till tomorrow, the finger won't run away. The old woman is right, said the robbers, and they ceased looking for the finger and sat down. The old woman then mixed a sleeping draught with their wine, and before long they were all lying on the floor of the cellar, fast asleep and snoring. As soon as the girl was assured of this, she came from behind the cask. She was obliged to step over the bodies of the sleepers, who were lying close together, and every moment she was filled with renewed dread lest she should awaken them. But God helped her, so that she passed safely over them, and then she and the old woman went upstairs, opened the door, and hastened as fast as they could from the murderer's den. They found the ashes scattered by the wind, but the peas and lentils had sprouted, and grown sufficiently above the ground, to guide them in the moonlight along the path. All night long they walked, and it was morning before they reached the mill. Then the girl told her father all that had happened. The day came that had been fixed for the marriage. The bridegroom arrived and also a large company of guests, for the miller had taken care to invite all his friends and relations. As they sat at the feast, each guest in turn was asked to tell a tale. The bride sat still and did not say a word. And you, my love, said the bridegroom, turning to her, is there no tale you know? Tell us something. I will tell you a dream, then, said the bride. I went alone through a forest and came at last to a house. Not a soul could I find within, but a bird that was hanging in a cage on the wall cried, Turn back, turn back, young maiden fair, linger not in this murderer's lair. And again a second time it said these words, My darling, this is only a dream. I went on through the house from room to room, but they were all empty, and everything was so grim and mysterious. At last I went down to the cellar, and there sat a very, very old woman, who could not keep her head still. I asked her if my betrothed lived here, and she answered, Ah, you poor child, you are come to a murderer's den. Your betrothed does indeed live here, but he will kill you without mercy and afterwards cook and eat you. My darling, this is only a dream. The old woman hid me behind a large cask, and scarcely had she done this when the robbers returned home, dragging a young girl along with them. They gave her three kinds of wine to drink, white, red, and yellow, and with that she died. My darling, this is only a dream. Then they tore off her dainty clothing, and cut her beautiful body into pieces and sprinkled salt upon it. My darling, this is only a dream and one of the robbers saw that there was a gold ring still left on her finger, and as it was difficult to draw off, he took a hatchet and cut off her finger, but the finger sprang into the air and fell behind the great cask into my lap. And here is the finger with the ring. And with these words the bride drew forth the finger and shewed it to the assembled guests. The bridegroom, who during this recital had grown deadly pale, up and tried to escape, but the guests seized him and held him fast. They delivered him up to justice, and he and all his murderous band were condemned to death for their wicked deeds. The End Tom Thumb A poor woodman sat in his cottage one night, smoking his pipe by the fireside, while his wife sat by his side spinning. How lonely it is, wife, said he, as he puffed out a long curl of smoke for you and me to sit here by ourselves, without any children to play about and amuse us while other people seem so happy and merry with their children. What you say is very true, said the wife, sighing, and turning round her wheel. How happy should I be if I had but one child? If it were ever so small, nay, if it were no bigger than my thumb, I should be very happy, and love it dearly. Now, odd as you may think it, it came to pass that this good woman's wish was fulfilled just in the very way she had wished it, for, not long afterwards, she had a little boy, who was quite healthy and strong, but was not much bigger than my thumb. So they said, well, we cannot say we have not got what we wished for, and little as he is, we will love him dearly. And they called him Thomas Thumb. They gave him plenty of food, yet for all they could do he never grew bigger, but kept just the same size as he had been when he was born. Still, his eyes were sharp and sparkling, and he soon showed himself to be a clever little fellow, who always knew well what he was about. One day, 
As the woodman was getting ready to go into the wood to cut fuel, he said, I wish I had someone to bring the cart after me, for I want to make haste. Oh, father, cried Tom, I will take care of that. The cart shall be in the wood by the time you want it. Then the woodman laughed and said, How can that be? You cannot reach up to the horse's bridle. Never mind that, father, said Tom. If my mother will only harness the horse, I will get into his ear and tell him which way to go. Well, said the father, we will try for once. When the time came the mother harnessed the horse to the cart and put Tom into his ear, and as he sat there the little man told the beast how to go, crying out, go on, and stop, as he wanted, and thus the horse went on just as well as if the woodman had driven it himself into the wood. It happened that as the horse was going a little too fast, and Tom was calling out, gently, gently, two strangers came up. What an odd thing that is, said one, there is a cart going along, and I hear a carter talking to the horse, but yet I can see no one. That is queer, indeed, said the other, let us follow the cart, and see where it goes. So they went on into the wood, till at last they came to the place where the woodman was. Then Tom Thumb, seeing his father, cried out, See, father, here I am with the cart, all right and safe. Now take me down. So his father took hold of the horse with one hand, and with the other took his son out of the horse's ear, and put him down upon a straw, where he sat as merry as you please. The two strangers were all this time looking on, and did not know what to say for wonder. At last one took the other aside, and said that little urchin will make our fortune, if we can get him, and carry him about from town to town as a show, we must buy him. So they went up to the woodman, and asked him what he would take for the little man. He will be better off, said they, with us than with you. I won't sell him at all, said the father. My own flesh and blood is dearer to me than all the silver and gold in the world. But Tom, hearing of the bargain they wanted to make, crept up his father's coat to his shoulder and whispered in his ear, Take the money, father, and let them have me. I'll soon come back to you. So the woodman at last said he would sell Tom to the strangers for a large piece of gold, and they paid the price. Where would you like to sit? said one of them. Oh, put me on the rim of your hat. That will be a nice gallery for me. I can walk about there and see the country as we go along. So they did as he wished, and when Tom had taken leave of his father they took him away with them. They journeyed until it began to be dusky, and then the little man said, let me get down, I'm tired. So the man took off his hat and put him down on a clod of earth in a ploughed field by the side of the road. But Tom ran about amongst the furrows and at last slipped into an old mouse hole. Good night, my masters, said he, I'm off. Mind and look sharp after me the next time. Then they ran at once to the place and poked the ends of their sticks into the mouse hole. But all in vain, Tom only crawled farther and farther in and at last it became quite dark, so that they were forced to go their way without their prize, as sulky as could be. When Tom found they were gone, he came out of his hiding place. What dangerous walking it is, said he, in this ploughed field. If I were to fall from one of these great clods, I should undoubtedly break my neck. At last, by good luck, he found a large empty snail shell. This is lucky, said he, I can sleep here very well and in he crept. Just as he was falling asleep, he heard two men passing by, chatting together, and one said to the other, How can we rob that rich parson's house of his silver and gold? I'll tell you, cried Tom. What noise was that? said the thief, frightened. I'm sure I heard someone speak. They stood still listening, and Tom said, Take me with you, and I'll soon show you how to get the parson's money. But where are you? said they. Look about on the ground, answered he, and listen where the sound comes from. At last the thieves found him out, and lifted him up in their hands. You little urchin, they said, what can you do for us? Why, I can get between the iron window bars of the parson's house, and throw you out whatever you want. That's a good thought, said the thieves. Come along, we shall see what you can do. When they came to the parson's house, Tom slipped through the window bars into the room and then called out as loud as he could bawl, Will you have all that is here? At this the thieves were frightened, and said softly, softly, Speak low, 
that you may not awaken anybody. But Tom seemed as if he did not understand them, and bawled out again, How much will you have? Shall I throw it all out? Now the cook lay in the next room, and hearing a noise she raised herself up in her bed and listened. Meantime the thieves were frightened, and ran off a little way, but at last they plucked up their hearts, and said, The little urchin is only trying to make fools of us. So they came back and whispered softly to him, saying, Now let us have no more of your roguish jokes, but throw us out some of the money. Then Tom called out as loud as he could, Very well. Hold your hands. Here it comes. The cook heard this quite plain, so she sprang out of bed and ran to open the door. The thieves ran off as if a wolf was at their tails, and the maid, having groped about and found nothing, went away for a light. By the time she came back, Tom had slipped off into the barn, and when she had looked about and searched every hole and corner, and found nobody, she went to bed, thinking she must have been dreaming with her eyes open. The little man crawled about in the hayloft, and at last found a snug place to finish his night's rest in, so he laid himself down, meaning to sleep till daylight, and then find his way home to his father and mother. But alas! How woefully he was undone! What crosses and sorrows happen to us all in this world! The cook got up early, before daybreak, to feed the cows, and going straight to the hayloft, carried away a large bundle of hay, with the little man in the middle of it, fast asleep. He still, however, slept on, and did not awake till he found himself in the mouth of the cow, for the cook had put the hay into the cow's rick, and the cow had taken Tom up in a mouthful of it. Good lackaday, said he, how came I to tumble into the mill? But he soon found out where he really was, and was forced to have all his wits about him, that he might not get between the cow's teeth, and so be crushed to death. At last down he went into her stomach. It is rather dark, said he. They forgot to build windows in this room to let the sun in. A candle would be no bad thing. Though he made the best of his bad luck, he did not like his quarters at all. And the worst of it was, that more and more hay was always coming down, and the space left for him became smaller and smaller. At last he cried out as loud as he could, Don't bring me any more hay. Don't bring me any more hay. The maid happened to be just then milking the cow, and hearing someone speak, but seeing nobody, and yet being quite sure it was the same voice that she had heard in the night, she was so frightened that she fell off her stool and overset the milk pail. As soon as she could pick herself up out of the dirt, she ran off as fast as she could to her master the parson, and said, Sir, sir, the cow is talking. But the parson said, Woman, thou art surely mad. However, he went with her into the cowhouse, to try and see what was the matter. Scarcely had they set foot on the threshold, when Tom called out, Don't bring me any more hay. Then the parson himself was frightened, and thinking the cow was surely bewitched, told his man to kill her on the spot. So the cow was killed, and cut up, and the stomach, in which Tom lay, was thrown out upon a dunghill. Tom soon set himself to work to get out, which was not a very easy task. But at last, just as he had made room to get his head out, fresh ill luck befell him. A hungry wolf sprang out, and swallowed up the whole stomach, with Tom in it, at one gulp, and ran away. Tom, however, was still not disheartened, and thinking the wolf would not dislike having some chat with him as he was going along, he called out, My good friend, I can show you a famous treat. Where's that? said the wolf. In such and such a house, said Tom, describing his own father's house. You can crawl through the drain into the kitchen and then into the pantry, and there you will find cakes, ham, beef, cold chicken, roast pig, apple dumplings, and everything that your heart can wish. The wolf did not want to be asked twice, so that very night he went to the house and crawled through the drain into the kitchen, and then into the pantry, and ate and drank there to his heart's content. As soon as he had had enough he wanted to get away, but he had eaten so much that he could not go out by the same way he came in. This was just what Tom had reckoned upon, and now he began to set up a great shout, making all the noise he could. Will you be easy? said the wolf. You'll awaken everybody in the house if you make such a clatter. What's that to me? said the little man, 
you have had your frolic, now I've a mind to be merry myself. And he began, singing and shouting as loud as he could. The woodman and his wife, being awakened by the noise, peeped through a crack in the door. But when they saw Wolf was there, you may well suppose that they were sadly frightened, and the woodman ran for his axe, and gave his wife a scythe. Do you stay behind, said the woodman, and when I have knocked him on the head you must rip him up with the scythe. Tom heard all this, and cried out, Father, Father, I am here, the wolf has swallowed me. And his father said, Heaven be praised. We have found our dear child again, and he told his wife not to use the scythe for fear she should hurt him. Then he aimed a great blow, and struck the wolf on the head, and killed him on the spot. And when he was dead they cut open his body and set Tommy free. Ah, said the father, what fears we have had for you. Yes, father, answered he, I have traveled all over the world, I think, in one way or other, since we parted, and now I am very glad to come home and get fresh air again. Why, where have you been, said his father? I have been in a mouse hole, and in a snail shell, and down a cow's throat, and in the wolf's belly, and yet here I am again, safe and sound. Well, said they, you are come back, and we will not sell you again for all the riches in the world. Then they hugged and kissed their dear little son, and gave him plenty to eat and drink, for he was very hungry, and then they fetched new clothes for him, for his old ones had been quite spoiled on his journey. So Master Thumb stayed at home with his father and mother, in peace, for though he had been so great a traveler, and had done and seen so many fine things, and was fond enough of telling the whole story, he always agreed that, after all, there's no place like home. The End Rumpelstiltskin By the side of a wood, in a country a long way off, ran a fine stream of water, and upon the stream there stood a mill. The miller's house was close by, and the miller, you must know, had a very beautiful daughter. She was, moreover, very shrewd and clever, and the miller was so proud of her that he one day told the king of the land, who used to come and hunt in the wood, that his daughter could spin gold out of straw. Now this king was very fond of money, and when he heard the miller's boast his greediness was raised, and he sent for the girl to be brought before him. Then he led her to a chamber in his palace where there was a great heap of straw, and gave her a spinning wheel, and said, All this must be spun into gold before morning as you love your life. It was in vain that the poor maiden said that it was only a silly boast of her father, for that she could do no such thing as spin straw into gold. The chamber door was locked, and she was left alone. She sat down in one corner of the room, and began to bewail her hard fate, when on a sudden the door opened, and a droll-looking little man hobbled in, and said, Good morrow to you, my good lass. What are you weeping for? Alas, said she, I must spin this straw into gold, and I know not how. What will you give me, said the hobgoblin, to do it for you? My necklace, replied the maiden. He took her at her word, and sat himself down to the wheel, and whistled and sang, round about, round about, lo and behold. Reel away, reel away, straw into gold. And round about the wheel went merrily. The work was quickly done, and the straw was all spun into gold. When the king came and saw this, he was greatly astonished and pleased. But his heart grew still more greedy of gain, and he shut up the poor miller's daughter again with a fresh task. Then she knew not what to do, and sat down once more to weep. But the dwarf soon opened the door, and said, What will you give me to do your task? The ring on my finger, said she. So her little friend took the ring, and began to work at the wheel again, and whistled and sang, Round about, round about. Lo and behold, reel away, reel away, straw into gold, till, long before morning, all was done again. The king was greatly delighted to see all this glittering treasure, but still he had not enough, so he took the miller's daughter to a yet larger heap, and said, All this must be spun tonight, and if it is, you shall be my queen. As soon as she was alone that dwarf came in, and said, What will you give me to spin gold for you this third time? I have nothing left, said she. Then say you will give me, said the little man, the first little child that you may have when you are queen. That may never be, thought the miller's daughter, 
and as she knew no other way to get her task done, she said she would do what he asked. Round went the wheel again to the old song, and the mannequin once more spun the heap into gold. The king came in the morning, and finding all he wanted, was forced to keep his word, so he married the miller's daughter, and she really became queen. At the birth of her first little child she was very glad, and forgot the dwarf, and what she had said. But one day he came into her room, where she was sitting playing with her baby, and put her in mind of it. Then she grieved sorely at her misfortune, and said she would give him all the wealth of the kingdom if he would let her off, but in vain, till at last her tears softened him, and he said, I will give you three days' grace, and if during that time you tell me my name, you shall keep your child. Now the queen lay awake all night, thinking of all the odd names that she had ever heard, and she sent messengers all over the land to find out new ones. The next day the little man came, and she began with Timothy, Ichabod, Benjamin, Jeremiah, and all the names she could remember. But to all and each of them he said, Madam, that is not my name. The second day she began with all the comical names she could hear of, Bandy Legs, Hunchback, Crookshanks, and so on. But the little gentleman still said to every one of them, Madam, that is not my name. The third day one of the messengers came back and said, I have traveled two days without hearing of any other names. But yesterday, as I was climbing a high hill, among the trees of the forest where the fox and the hare bid each other good night, I saw a little hut, and before the hut burned a fire, and round about the fire a funny little dwarf was dancing upon one leg, and singing, Merrily the feast I'll make. Today I'll brew, tomorrow bake. Merrily I'll dance and sing, for next day will a stranger bring. Little does my lady dream Rumpelstiltskin is my name. When the queen heard this she jumped for joy and as soon as her little friend came she sat down upon her throne, and called all her court round to enjoy the fun, and the nurse stood by her side with the baby in her arms, as if it was quite ready to be given up. Then the little man began to chuckle at the thought of having the poor child to take home with him to his hut in the woods, and he cried out, Now, lady, what is my name? Is it John? asked she. No, madam. Is it Tom? No, madam. Is it Jemmy? It is not. Can your name be Rumpelstiltskin? said the lady slyly. Some which told you that, some which told you that, cried the little man, and dashed his right foot in a rage so deep into the floor, that he was forced to lay hold of it with both hands to pull it out. Then he made the best of his way off, while the nurse laughed and the baby crowed, and all the court jeered at him for having had so much trouble for nothing, and said, we wish you a very good morning, and a merry feast, Mr. R. Clever Gretel. There was once a cook named Gretel, who wore shoes with red heels, and when she walked out with them on, she turned herself this way and that, was quite happy and thought, you certainly are a pretty girl. And when she came home she drank, in her gladness of heart, a draught of wine, and as wine excites a desire to eat, she tasted the best of whatever she was cooking until she was satisfied and said, The cook must know what the food is like. It came to pass that the master one day said to her, Gretel, there is a guest coming this evening. Prepare me two fowls very daintily. I will see to it, master, answered Gretel. She killed two fowls, scalded them, plucked them, put them on the spit, and towards evening set them before the fire, that they might roast. The fowls began to turn brown, and were nearly ready, but the guest had not yet arrived. Then Gretel called out to her master, If the guest does not come, I must take the fowls away from the fire, but it will be a sin and a shame if they are not eaten the moment they are at their juiciest. The master said, I will run myself, and fetch the guest. When the master had turned his back, Gretel laid the spit with the fowls on one side, and thought, Standing so long by the fire there, makes one sweat and thirsty. Who knows when they will come? Meanwhile, I will run into the cellar, and take a drink. She ran down, set a jug, said, God bless it for you, Gretel, and took a good drink, and thought that wine should flow on, and should not be interrupted, and took yet another hearty draught. Then she went and put the fowls down again to the fire, basted them, and drove the spit merrily round. 
but as the roast meat smelled so good, Gretel thought, something might be wrong, it ought to be tasted. She touched it with her finger, and said, ah, how good fowls are. It certainly is a sin and a shame that they are not eaten at the right time. She ran to the window, to see if the master was not coming with his guests, but she saw no one, and went back to the fowls and thought, one of the wings is burning. I had better take it off and eat it. So she cut it off, ate it, and enjoyed it, and when she had done, she thought, the other must go down too, or else master will observe that something is missing. When the two wings were eaten, she went and looked for her master, and did not see him. It suddenly occurred to her, who knows? They are perhaps not coming at all, and have turned in somewhere. Then she said, Well, Gretel, enjoy yourself. One fowl has been cut in two, take another drink, and eat it up entirely. When it is eaten you will have some peace. Why should God's good gifts be spoiled? So she ran into the cellar again, took an enormous drink, and ate up the one chicken in great glee. When one of the chickens was swallowed down, and still her master did not come, Gretel looked at the other and said, What one is, the other should be likewise, the two go together. What's right for the one is right for the other. I think if I were to take another draught it would do me no harm. So she took another hearty drink, and let the second chicken follow the first. While she was making the most of it, her master came and cried, Hurry up, Gretel, the guest is coming directly after me. Yes, sir, I will soon serve up, answered Gretel. Meantime the master looked to see that the table was properly laid, and took the great knife, wherewith he was going to carve the chickens, and sharpened it on the steps. Presently the guest came, and knocked politely and courteously at the house door. Gretel ran, and looked to see who was there, and when she saw the guest, she put her finger to her lips and said, Hush! Hush! Go away as quickly as you can, if my master catches you it will be the worse for you. He certainly did ask you to supper but his intention is to cut off your two ears. Just listen how he is sharpening the knife for it. The guest heard the sharpening, and hurried down the steps again as fast as he could. Gretel was not idle. She ran screaming to her master, and cried, You have invited a fine guest. Why, Gretel? What do you mean by that? Yes, said she, he has taken the chickens which I was just going to serve up, off the dish, and has run away with them. That's a nice trick, said her master, and lamented the fine chickens. If he had but left me one, so that something remained for me to eat. He called to him to stop, but the guest pretended not to hear. Then he ran after him with the knife still in his hand, crying, Just one, just one, meaning that the guest should leave him just one chicken, and not take both. The guest, however, thought no otherwise than that he was to give up one of his ears, and ran as if fire were burning under him in order to take them both with him. The End And there you have it, folks. We've reached the end of this incredible story together, but the adventure doesn't stop here. We have a variety of story videos like this one available for your enjoyment. To watch more, just click here. If you've enjoyed this story and want more mind-blowing stories, be sure to smash that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss out on our next epic upload. Trust me, you won't want to miss what's coming next.